Good morning, everyone. On behalf of the Director General, Human Resources, Ministry of the Public Service, the Director of the Learning and Development Directorate, and the Chief Fire Officer of the Barbados Fire Service, I extend a warm welcome to you this morning to this presentation on fire safety in the workplace, which is being hosted by the Learning and Development Directorate in collaboration with the Barbados Fire Service. I am Jeanette King, Human Resource Officer at the Learning and Development Directorate and a moderator for this webinar. Our presenter this morning is Mr. Patrick Edwards, whom I will formally introduce to you after I brief you on the guidelines for our participation in this webinar. Other than the presenters and my voice, you may occasionally hear that of our producer, Mr. Sherwin Ellis, Senior Human Resource Officer at the Learning and Development Directorate. Colleagues, here are the guidelines for your participation in the webinar. We would like you to keep your microphones muted and your cameras turned off. This helps to ensure that bandwidth is preserved so that connectivity is not compromised. Pause and or minimize distractions as much as possible. As you ingest this important information, take some time to reflect on your own experiences and jot down your notes, prepare your questions and comments. We will be using the chat box to communicate so you can post those burning questions and comments as well in the chat. There will be a few intimated questions during the course of the discussion, which you will be invited to respond to in the chat. At the end of the presentation, there will be a questions and answer segment. During the questions and answer segment, or even before, you can place your questions in the chat and they will be shared with the presenter who will respond to you by audio. A link to the Learning and Development Directorate's participant feedback form will be placed in the chat towards the end of the webinar. And we would really appreciate that you complete and submit the form. Please note that this session is being recorded and the recording will be made available to you on the Learning and Development Directorate's YouTube channel. Colleagues, allow me to introduce our presenter. Mr. Patrick Edwards. Mr. Patrick Edwards is currently acting station officer at the Barbados Fire Service. As station officer, he is second in command at the airport based station. He presents this information to us this morning through a wealth of knowledge he has gained from his 29 years plus of experience in the Barbados Fire Service and various qualifications related to fire and fire emergency management. Ms. Evers is a certified international fire service instructor and a trained hazardous materials technician. He has also been trained in weapons of mass destruction operations through the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, OPCW, and he would have received his training in Brazil, Colombia, Argentina, and Slovakia. Mr. Evers is also a first aid and CPR instructor with the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Barbados and an outsourced facilitator for the Learning and Development Directorate. When Mr. Edwards is not addressing fire management and firefighting matters, he attends the All Saints Anglican Church where he is a member. His social activities include cricket and he is a certified cricket umpire with the Barbados Cricket Umpires Association. He is also a member of the Sing Out Barbados Folk Group. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, a well-rounded Mr. Patrick Edwards, your presenter. Welcome, Mr. Edwards. Thank you for accepting the invitation to share this information to enable us to deploy best practices for fire safety at our various organizations. Over to you, Mr. Edwards. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I hope that this presentation finds you in the best of health. As I was introduced, I am Patrick Edwards, and at this point, I wish to bring you greetings from the Chief Fire Officer and 
the members of the Barbados Fire Service. This morning, our learning objectives, we are going to be looking at the legislation that governs fire safety at work. So by the end of my presentation, you will be able to tell me that. You will also be able to discuss the fire safety measures for the workplace. And uh, last, but by no means least, outline the appropriate actions in a fire emergency at the workplace. Let me be quick to say to you that some of what we are discussing here can also be applied at the home. So I do not want for you to only think that this information relates to the workplace, but you can take home some of this information. My first question to you this morning, and I want for you to engage me a lot in the chat. So feel free to place your responses inside of the chat and I shall endeavor to respond to them. Um, my first question, what is the name of the legislation that governs fire safety at the workplace? Colleagues, you can place your responses in the chat. I see we have a response here from Suzette Mears and David Linton. They're saying Health and Safety Act 2005, uh, the Shaw Act. And Tony Bass is saying Health and Safety at Work Act. And we have Kay. Okay, good, you're just saying safety and health at work at as well. Very good, very good. Yes, indeed. So that, the name of that legislation, as you said, is the Safety and Health at Work Act, CAP 356. I will also be quick to say to you that there is another piece of legislation that is attached to that particular one we call the SHOP Act which was enacted in 2015. And this particular act, although not applicable to the public service, it actually gives the chief fire officer the power or the authority to enter any place of work to carry out or address any concerns. But to look back at the fire safety act that you have just wonderfully described, Sections 32 to 48 actually speaks to the provision of fire safety issues in the workplace. For instance, 32 speaks to the provision and maintenance of fire escape. And when we are talking about fire escape, we are actually talking about your points of egress, your exits. So very often you will see the fire department coming through and they're actually doing inspections. They are not only checking for fire extinguishers, but they're also looking at your ability to escape in case anything goes wrong. Section 33, certificate of the inspection of fire escapes, where the chief fire officer has the responsibility. And when, and they want for you to understand this, guys, that do not think as the chief fire officer in this context as Errol Maynard, because anyone that represents the fire service in this particular function is considered to be the chief fire officer for all intents and purposes of the law. Section 34 actually speaks to factories and those factories that store highly inflammable materials and how they're supposed to be stored. Also, 35 speaks to the maintenance and inspection of means of escape as it relates to a certificate that the chief fire officer will issue once you are compliant with the law. I will be quick to say to you that under this section, it also says to you that if there are any changes to what the fire service has approved 
then that information should be forwarded to us because you will have to be re-inspected because you have just altered the condition of our permission or our certification. 37 speaks very quickly to the conformity of regulations. And if I can just look back at 36, where it actually also tells you about your right of appeal. And when I say your right, I'm talking about the occupier. So if you think that you have been wrong, then you have the right to appeal against the chief fire officer. And this section is spoken to in that. Section 38 actually speaks to the provision of early warning systems. And when we are talking about early warning systems, we are actually talking about the installation of systems within the workplace that if anything goes wrong, that you have early notification that it is time to get out. Or, and depending on the construction of your facility, maybe get to your stairwell. But all of that is spoken to in that particular section. Section 39 speaks to the need to train your personnel. In other words, persons should be trained to use the equipment. Those persons should be trained to use to look after the personnel that occupy the building at any one time. And that is spoken to there. And section 42 speaks to the power of the chief fire officer to enter a workplace at any time. I when we say at any time, not at any time when it is closed, but when it is open for business. Now there's also sections in 102 and 103 that actually gives the right to the worker that they cannot be dismissed if they lodge a complaint or if they request an inspection that can be a problem for their own personal safety or person. And section 103 of the act speaks to the right of the employer to consult with the workers' representatives, which could be, in this case, maybe the union, and making the workplace a safer place. So indeed, you can see the importance. And there's one other section that I will also want to draw to your attention, which is section 105. And this actually speaks to the authority of the minister in all of this as it relates to fire safety. So let us get that clearly understood that section 105 actually speaks to the power or the authority of the minister. Moving nicely along. So the question is, what is fire safety in the workplace? And when we are talking about fire safety in the workplace, let us get a good understanding as to what we are talking about. And it's a combination of measures that the workplace should have in place to prevent cases of fire, warn employees, visitors, and other workers at the work plant or work site in the event of a fire. Provide for safe evacuation, restrict the spread of fire to safeguard against harm, damage, or loss. Now that is a mouthful. All this is saying to you, it tells you about the consciousness that you should be able to exhibit that in the event that anything untoward occurs in the workplace as it relates to fire, there should be a measure or measures put in place that you can follow this course of actions to be able to be safe. We are blessed in Barbados that we have not had many instances of this particular issue as it relates to the workplace. But the statistics show, yes, indeed, that we tend to have more house fires than workplace fires. Why? Because of the fact that there is a great advancement in persons standing up and taking note of this particular issue. So a question to you, and you can place this information again in the chat. What are some of the safety measures that the workplace should have in place. 
and you can share that with me. Okay, we have Monique saying fire fire extinguishers. Thank you, Monique. And we have exit plans, smoke detectors, clearly marked exits, emergency exits. Again, we have yes, yeah, someone is saying assembly point, an emergency plan. Excellent. Excellent. So I know that you have a good grasp as to what we are talking about. And virtually everything that we have here in the presentation, you have just voiced to me. Indeed, it is important though for us or all workplaces to conduct risk assessments. And I will say quickly that we will actually expand on that a little bit as we go forward. It is also important to have emergency plans I mean, the question is, and after this presentation, maybe you can challenge your management. Uh, if you do not, or you are not aware of the emergency plan, what is it? Where is it? Your fire safety equipment, and as someone said just now, I think it was money, that talk about extinguishers, absolutely. Smoke alarms, and I'm going to elucidate on that a little bit further. Of course, fire safety signage fire safety or what we call evacuation procedures. And of course, last but by no means least, staff training. That is important and I will explain why. So let's look first of all at the fire risk assessment. You know, for all intents and purposes, this one is seriously overlooked. Very often many persons only think about the risk assessment after something has happened. But let's get into what the risk assessment really is. What is involved in the process? It enables you to identify the fire hazards inside of the workplace. And when we talk about the fire hazards, we're talking about those um, outlived pieces of equipment, persons storing things too high, st storing things too close to the ceiling where we have lights and all that. All of these are hazards that we must make note of. Also identify people that are at risk. There are some government departments that we have persons that work in labs and all those areas. There must be a plan placed for them that in case anything happens, then they can actually evacuate safely. You are also in a position to evaluate, remove, or reduce the risk wherever possible. I know full well that there is not every risk that you can remove because by our very nature or by our very existence or by our very um, function in our job, it is already inherently dangerous. So we might not be able to remove that. But once we have evaluated properly, we might be able to reduce it if we cannot remove it. And a simple case is by ensuring that you sensitize those workers that are working in that particular area. It is also important in that risk assessment to record your findings. Prepare an emergency plan and provide training wherever possible. And I would have hinted at that one before. And because the risk assessment it is not a static document, it is actually a very dynamic document because as your organization changes focus, dependent on the needs that are demanded by society, then really and truly that risk assessment should follow suit. We're gonna look at some common fire safety risk in the workplace and how to address them. And we have three here, and I want you to understand that this presentation does not limit or may us believe that these are the only things. This actually gives you that opportunity for you to be sensitized and take note of your surroundings. Very often we do not do that. So we can look here at some of electrical faults, that's a major problem. Human error, that's another problem. And of course, poor housekeeping. We're gonna deal with the first one where we talk about overloading outlets. And 
I don't want to believe that this happens a lot inside of the workplace. And notice what I said, I don't want to believe it now that it does not happen. I think I'm seeing some smiles on some person's faces as it relates to that particular one. But remember this, everybody, you can easily overload your electrical circuits. In this particular picture, here is that you have one of these multi-socketed um, outlets and you have two devices plugged into it. Now, it is important to recognize that this is possibly a 20 amp breaker and it can only give you that 20 amps of electricity. So if you are going to the stores and you are purchasing these cheap pieces of equipment and you are plugging it into your system that you can get more outlets, this is where you're gonna be asking for trouble. Also, we have one here called daisy chaining and I hope no one is guilty of this and especially instead of the workplace. There are a number of violations in this situation. Number one, and the biggest problem here, this person has a power strip plugged into another power strip. Now, in this case, we call it the proper name as daisy chaining, but there's also another name associated with this particular one. We actually call that piggybacking. So this person obviously has lots of equipment or see the need to have lots of devices in this particular area. And they have plugged a surge protector into another surge protector or power strip as the case may be. And I'll explain that in a short while. There's a difference between the two. The next problem, and I know that this happened in some workplaces because as we go into certain workplaces and we do our inspections, we recognize that persons actually have the surge protector or even the power strip actually naked down on carpet. Now, if there are any issues relating to this surge protector, you can imagine that you can easily have a structural fire starting based off of what we are seeing here in this picture. And of course, you can see in the last one, power surge. And that is the purpose of your surge protector, to protect your sensitive equipment from electrical surges or what we call electrical hits. And I do not want you thinking that the surge protector is supposed to last forever. Back in the 80s and maybe early 90s, this was a major problem for us. Where your equipment used to be plugged directly into the system and as the lighting power has spikes in the system, that spike normally goes up to our equipment and used to destroy our equipment. And then we will be up at the Barbados Light and Power protesting and demanding compensation. So the purpose of the surge protector was supposed to prevent this from happening. If anything, let the surge destroy the power, the surge protector. And notice what we are talking about. We are seeing here because the power strip will not offer you any protection at all. As a matter of fact, I hate to go into workplaces and to see a power strip because really and truly you are creating an unsafe situation because that does not protect you. It does not protect the government's equipment. So ensure that all of that is expensive equipment, that all taxpayer dollars of purchase is properly connected to a surge protector. So we should be able to reduce the risk of electrical faults. And here we, again, provide sufficient outlets. And that is one of the problems because sometimes many persons do not have the adequate outlet. So they tend to go the route maybe of using an extension cord. But I will say to you that the extension cord is a no-no. It is supposed to be only used on equipment for a short period of time. So an extension cord should not be permanently powering equipment. Of course, we talked about this one before, the use of surge protectors. Your equipment must be properly grounded and your technical persons, if there are any issues, you should really be making that the subject of a report to ensure that that can be corrected. Periodically service and maintain your equipment. 
And that is one of our biggest problems, maintenance. Maintenance is always a major issue. But wheresoever possible, I want to encourage you to ensure that your equipment is properly serviced and, and ensure that the service record is available. That is very important. And last but by no means least, report damaged electrical outlets or cars and do not use. I do not expect for this to be happening inside of the workplace. I do not expect for this to be happening inside of your home. This is one of the major problems of workplace and home house fires. Human error, incorrect use of electrical equipment. You know, sometimes we find ourselves plugging equipment into incorrect fusing or putting it, it, electrical equipment into incorrect areas where it is not really designed for. That is human error. Maybe it is out of ignorance. Not reporting faulty equipment. You know, sometimes we go to work and say, they say home at me, you know, but yes, it is because it is, it is where you are able to maintain your home. So you have a responsibility that if you see faulty machinery, make it the subject of a report. And if that report is not suffice in a verbal report, then I suggest write that report so that you have a record of that report. Carelessly discarding cigarette box and lit matches. Now, many years ago, when our headquarters was in Provence Street, I always remember, and I hope that the guilty party is not in this presentation this morning, but someone actually threw a lit cigarette butt out of the building that was next door, which was the old you know, yes building. And the only place that that cigarette butt could have lodged was in a piece of rotten trimming board. And of course, it started to burn. Can you imagine that if the fire station had burned down out of that? Would, would that make interesting reading? But yes, but the point that I'm making here is that it is important that you must ensure that then again, you should not be smoking on government property anyhow, because all government properties are no smoking property. So I'm not even going to go into that. And of course, lack of knowledge of the fire safety procedures. And one of the things that I believe that government departments need to do. Your orientation program should not only entail the functions of the job, but I will also suggest that it should also entail the safety procedures, because that is the area that we are going into. And if we are going to be aiming for this much talked about first world status, it is important that our we don't only think about the task but we also think about the safety of our people because that human resource element is very critical. Um, us to reduce risk of human error is important. Um, basic fire safety training, the fire service offers this. You know, the private sector, I find they normally take this up at the drop of a hat. But in many instances in the public service, we recognize that this is a very slow service when it comes to the public service. So really and truly, as somebody said, I think it was Monique that made the point earlier about the fire extinguisher. The fire extinguisher will not jump off the wall if there's the alarm raised that there's a fire and put the fire out. No, it must be human intervention. So you must ensure that your staff is properly trained and they are confident that they can help protect the workplace. Proper use of office equipment. And of course, of course, we cannot understate this particular one, fire safety drills. Now, I have had many experiences in working with government departments. I'm not even going to talk about the private sector in this particular situation, but in the public sector, I think that for the major part, too many people take it as a joke. Too many, take, too many people take it as an opportunity that they can go and pay the light bill or they can go and run some errand. That is not correct. Technically speaking, you are walking off of your job. Not only that, you are also placing 
fire fighting personnel at risk because the law requires for you to do fire safety drills at least once a year. Now, of course, if you're the business that you conduct is of high risk, best practice, and I repeat that, best practice is that you practice that fire safety drill a little bit more often, at least once a quarter, or as your department can afford. But important, I want to stress here, that whenever there is a drill, I want for you to participate and participate well. I've had good experiences, and I've also had bad experiences. You know, some people, especially when they know that it is a drill, some people do not even want to leave their desk. Some people don't want to leave their office. That's wrong. Because once you participate or you exit the building and you go into the assembly area, once the fire service arrive, it is important that you stay with your work group that you can be accounted for. So when you are doing your drills, this is the course of action I expect. And please, 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 the bikes. And ladies, I am not pointing at you because at the same time, I'm also going to say the cell phones. So be careful. I don't have a problem if you have your bike, providing that your bike works beside of you. But if it's a fire safety drill and you have to go into a locker room or whatsoever, then that is a no-no. Poor housekeeping. And poor housekeeping, we talk about keeping the place tidy. When you keep the place or the office on tidy and anything happens, then an untidy environment creates that advancement or for that rapid fire spread. So it is important that you keep your environment tidy. So good practice, good practice, routine cleaning. There are some departments that do this one very, very well. Reorganize, you know, all those things that you do not need, you put them in the archive and so on, arrange for pickups, or the things that you know, once these are equipped, um, records that is obsolete and so on and so forth, have them disposed of. But remember, it must occur in consistency with the department or government policy. That is important. I want to repeat that. Don't just go and take government records and throw them away and say, okay, these old, it must be consistent with government policy. So the emergency plan. And earlier we spoke about the emergency plan and we'll go into a little bit more as to what it is. So I'm gonna invite you quickly to tell me Colleagues, you may place your responses in the chat. What is an emergency plan? Emergency plan. Okay, we have Monique saying the emergency plan is an instrument that shows how to exit in case of an emergency. Thank you, Monique. Uh, we have a comment here. Uh, yes, Kathy. Yes, we realize that we're having um, a little bit of um, some technical issues. Um, this seems to be an ongoing thing, but we will um, pray that we are able to continue. Thank you, Kathy. All right, I'm back. All right. So also, uh, bye, we have everybody. Charmaine. Charmaine, Mr. Evers, can you hear us? Yes. Can you hear? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Okay. Oh, yes. So I was, just read, I was just sharing with you what Charmaine has placed for her um, explanation of the, the emergency plan. Charmaine has said that it is a document which outlines mm -hmm. exit and assembly procedures in the case of mm -hmm. an emergency. And I don't know if you had heard earlier, heard earlier but um, we also had... 
Monique, um, who indicated that uh, it is an instrument that shows how to exit in case of an emergency. All, all of what was said by the participants, that is true, that is very good information, but it goes a little bit further than that. So the emergency plan is actually a written document that sets out the required actions and procedures for an emergency and the resources available. It also serves for prevention, mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. This is something that should be done by individual government departments. Ensure that the event that anything untoward occurs, not only that you the day, for instance, let's say a hurricane. How do we a service to provide for the public of Barbados? So this document actually speaks to that. So these are some key elements inside of that plan. The required actions and procedures of emergency response agencies. So numbers like the fire service, the police and ambulance service, and so on and so forth. The roles and listing of designated personnel and contact information. You know, some time ago, I remember going to a particular institution. We had an activated alarm and it was after hours. And the person responsible was saying, well, I know that I ain't coming on there now. You know, that is not what we want for an ideal situation. That person must recognize what their responsibility is. The available resources, the equipment used in an emergency. Detailed floor plans to indicating to show where you are at and to show where your exit points and so on. Map showing evacuation routes. Location of the assembly area. A plan for removal and storage of important documents. And I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Scheduled for conducting of fire drills and staff training and safety measures. So this one is by no means a quick fix. This is a process where a no normally the health and safety committee takes the responsibility to put together these things, at least in the private sector. I don't know a lot of the public sector and this particular areas. Maybe somebody can guide me if their department have these things in place. When planning for an emergency is important, you got to remember wheelchair users, especially if you have clients that are in, in a wheelchair or persons that are deaf or hard of hearing, blind or visually challenged persons. All of these persons must be catered for inside of your document. That is very important. Learning or intellectually impaired persons, elderly or obese persons, all of this is to be reflected in your plan. Of course, your fire safety equipment. And as we press on, let's deal first of all with the smoke detector. Now I want for persons to understand that there is a difference between the smoke detector and the smoke alarm. Actually, the law does not favor one or the next. However, it must be understood that if you are using a small alarm. A small alarm is the isolated system that you can go to the hardware store and purchase one maybe for, for about $20 or so. Whereas on the other hand, the smoke detector is an electrically wired system that once it detects any foreign substances in the atmosphere, it sends a message to your fire alarm panel which rings Mr. Edwards? It is apparent that Mr. Edwards has dropped out just once again. And we hope that this can be rectified quickly. So participants, just bear with us. I'm certain some of you yourselves are experiencing some issues and uh, clearly this is out of our hands. So we just need to, um, we just need to be cautious of that and bear 
with us for just a bit. Colleagues, does anyone else have uh, some connectivity issues from their end? If you if you are, you can put a green tick. You can put a tick in the chat. Or you can simply say yes in the chat. We just want to uh, verify whether this is widespread or just if actually we're having the issue here. This may just well mean that we may have to reschedule if it persists. Okay, Gregory Jones says he's having issues on his end. Mrs. Fagan is having issues as well. Okay. Okay, so it's not. Okay, just a few. We have yeah, some saying they're having issues from their end and others saying they're fine at their end. Okay, so what we're trying to do now is um, from our end, trying to see if uh, we can actually do something. I'm not certain. Like I said before, if this is persistent, we may jolly well need to reschedule. it up then so before the alarm system picks it up what you will actually do is to pull or follow the instructions and everyone in the building will be aware that there is a problem so there are two types that you see here which we call the double action pull station, and the other one, we don't see this one very often, break the glass and press. Mr. Edwards, no. excuse yes, me no. just a moment. If you could just go a little bit back to the fire, the smoke detector. Yes, I am here. Right, could you just go over that one very briefly? Okay, right. So as I was saying to you guys, the as it relates to the smoke detector, the smoke detector is part of a bigger system. It is electrically wired. And uh, there are a number of what we call heads. Now in the smoke detector, what happens? It normally tests the atmosphere every five to six seconds or so. And if it detects anything foreign in the atmosphere, and it could be as easy as aerosol or dust, then chances are it will send a message to the alarm panel. And as a result, the alarm panel will ring a bell indicating to everyone that you have a problem and your plan should start here. How do we evacuate? Um, so it is very important to recognize that every time that you hear the alarm, it does not mean that there is a fire, but it also does not mean that you should not take some course of action. And that is important. Remember, inside of the home, you will not normally find these. You will actually find what we call is the smoke alarm, where you can purchase for about $20 or so from any hardware store. I spoke already about the fire alarm system. Are we comfortable with this particular one? Right, where we have the pull station, and this is the automatic way of activating the system, a correction, the manual way. So once you see something and you pull it, this will activate the alarm for you. 
Now we are on to the fire extinguisher. And I think that everybody has an idea as to what a fire extinguisher is. I'm gonna ask you a question here though. I want for you to tell me, do you know where the nearest fire extinguisher is in your office or your workplace? If the answer is yes, you can type Y. If the answer is no, then type no. And my producer will provide that information for me. Okay, we have a majority of a person saying yes, that they actually do, do know where their fire extinguisher is. Fan fantastic. The majority fantastic. just had probably just two persons indicating no, but everybody else is very good saying yes, they know where theirs is. That's about, Fantastic. I just guess about one person said that they didn't know. <laughs> okay, now that, that, that no con concerns me a lot. That no concerns me a lot. But it is not suffice to know where the extinguisher is at. It is also important to know that the fire extinguisher must be fully charged. And that is why when the fire service comes to do the inspection, they are checking to find out if your extinguisher is ready to be used in the event that there is a problem. So a fire extinguisher is a manually operated device for extinguishing small fires. So in other words, what we're talking about fires in the incipient or the beginning stage. So if you see a big fire and you got your fire extinguisher in your car, you don't get out and say, okay, step back everybody, I got this one. That is not for the fire extinguisher, that is for the fire service. So pressing on, it is very important. And just give me a step back here a minute a little bit more about the extinguisher before I tell you about the uses of it. We have different types of fire extinguishers. You have water extinguishers, foam extinguishers, dry powder extinguishers, um, dry chemical, wet chemical, all of these are different types of extinguishers. The extinguisher that you have in your office, it will be the one that was recommended for that particular area. In other words, using the wrong extinguisher on a fire can make it worse. And I think everybody is aware of that. So sometimes you will look on the extinguisher in your office and you will see on it uh, extinguisher mark A, B, C. Let me explain what that is. That represent the classes of fires that that fire extinguisher can extinguish. And quite quickly, a class A fire is anything involving paper, wood, grass, anything of an organic nature. That is class A. Glass B, flammables, diesel, paints, varnishes, alcohol, all types of liquids. Once it is a flammable, then that is considered to be a glass B. Now, really, truly, the best extinguisher to use on that would be foam, whereas we know that water is the best extinguisher to use on class A. And then we got class C, which is electrical. But actually, we're talking about electrical devices. So if your laptop or your desktop or whatsoever is plugged in, as something or towards occur and it starts to burn. Once it is plugged in or driven, driven by electricity at that point, it is considered to be a class C fire. And the best extinguisher for that is really a carbon dioxide extinguisher. But we have this super extinguisher that we call the ABC. It tells you that you can extinguish any one of those classes with this particular extinguisher. I hope everybody got that one clear. So yes, indeed, if you see an ABC extinguisher, it represents the classes of fires that can be extinguished by that fire extinguisher. So we go on to the use of the extinguisher. And I want for you to remember this, this little acronym we see here, PASS. But before we get to PASS, I always want you to remember this. It is important to raise the alarm before you go to tackle or confront any fire because you do not want for the fire to get a head start on you or on others that are occupying the building. So the first time before you use the extinguisher, always raise the alarm. And how we do that in Barbados, we shout for fire, fire, fire. Then you will pull the pen, you will aim at the base of the fire, you will squeeze the handles, you will sweep from side to side. It is important to remember though, 
that fire extinguishers are either rechargeable or disposable. So if you have a rechargeable extinguisher, once you use it, you should give it to your supervisor, you should give it to your health and safety person because then it will need to be recharged. If it is disposable, then they have the responsibility of disposing it and replacing that particular extinguisher. That is very important. But remember, make the right decision to use a portable fire extinguisher. And all six of these things here are important. If you are trained to use the fire extinguisher, use it, go right ahead. What I don't want you to be doing is what we call Skylar or horse plane with a fire extinguisher because you can actually kill someone. If you know what is burning, if you do not know what is burning, then avoid using the extinguisher because using the wrong extinguisher can make it worse. I made that point before. If the fire is not spreading rapidly, anytime a fire is spreading rapidly, that is a big fire. That is for the fire service. If smoke and heat has not filled the area, anytime that smoke and heat has filled the area, that is a big fire. If you have a clear path of escape, very important. In other words, I want to advocate or encourage you that anytime you're gonna use a fire extinguisher, always keep an exit at your back. Notice what I said, an exit, not a door, because that door might be leading you into uh, another office or into a storeroom. So always keep an exit at your back so that if you can't make the fight, be prepared to make the flight. And the last one here, and very important, follow your instincts. Anytime your instinct tell you, I can't do this, or you have any negative thoughts, then I will suggest to you, don't use the fire extinguisher, you get outside. That is very, very important. So I have a question for you. And there again, my producer will let me know how you have done on this particular question. So is it A or B? For the use of the extinguisher, the acronym PASS stands for press the button, Activate the nozzle, squeeze the dispenser, squirt the extinguishing agent. That's A or B. Pull the safety pin, aim at the base of the fire, squeeze the handles, and sweep from side to side or left to right. I expect your responses. Let me see what those students you are. So producer, you can tell me how persons have responded. Okay, um, I think we have everybody was listening very, very carefully because everybody has indicated B. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Well, I feel as though my time has not been wasted. Excellent, excellent. Just remember though, I hope you do not have to do it. But in case you have to do it, at least I am confident that you can do it. Now, these are some fire safety signages. Um, I wonder if anybody can give me any feedback on what the signage at A, C, and E, what that is seeing. Any takers, any takers? I'm challenging you. Let me see how, let me see how good you are. If you can get all of these right, then my day is complete. So A, any takers so far, producer? We have Monique has indicated um, exit, fire exit. For okay. A. For A. Well, colleagues, Monique. what you would need to do is to indicate the letter so that I can understand what you're indicating because I wouldn't know, for example, which one. Because remember, our presenter, Mr. Edwards, has asked you about A, um, D, and C. E. Oh, sorry, A, C, and, and E. A, yes. C, D, and E, is it? Okay. Right, so it please indicate, please indicate no the letter. Right, okay. So, A. Okay, so we have Janice is saying, Janice is saying A is exit, Monique saying A is exit, Gregory is saying A is fire exit. And oh, then, uh-huh, go ahead. Okay. Um, then, um, Michelle, See? Michelle is saying C, oh dear, C is the exit point, right? That's okay. what she's indicated. Uh -huh. okay. Miranda says, um, A, use the stairs. Excellent. 
Excellent. Remember that one, Miranda. Very good. In right. case of a okay. fire, use the stairs. That's I am it. looking very to good. see if I have anybody for D. E? Well, I don't see any D, but I see E is indicated yes, is it? assembly, uh -huh. assembly point. Assembly point, or what we call the master point. So just to ensure that you understand, let's go first of all with A. That signage in the case, in the case of a fire, please use the stairs. You very often see this one by the elevator. You do not want to be using elevators in the event of a fire. Elevator shafts could become easily filled with smoke and that contributes to death. B is in case of a fire, press here. So remember when we were talking about the manual call points, this is a very good example of the signage representing that. And of course, the C, this way, you see the arrow, this way is to an exit. And remember that an exit is a place that takes you outside, not outside and still inside of the facility or the building, but actually outside, that is an exit. All the others would be considered as um, access to exits, but an exit actually takes you outside. And of course, you can see here at D, this is an emergency exit where door is open for you to make your way out of the building. Of course, and you wonderfully said just now participants that E is the assembly area or what we call the master point. And of course, at F we have, in case of a fire, there's a fire extinguisher. And you can see the emblem of the fire extinguisher. And G is the hose reel. Incidentally, though, we do not encourage people to use the hose reel because you are not firefighters. All you are a basic lay persons with some knowledge and some skills. But if you use the hose reel, it is going to cause you to stay in the environment a lot longer. You do not have respiratory protection. So hence, you can be causing injury to your respiratory system or to yourself. And that time you pre pretending that you're a fireman. We don't want you to pretend that. So we want you to use the fire extinguisher. So as we move on, as we move on, what are three critical actions to take if a fire starts in your workplace? And of course, what is the fire emergency number? So you can honor me with your submissions and let's see how good you are. Challenge you, let's go, get it right. Okay, we have Michelle saying sound the alarm. Sound the alarm or raise the alarm, okay. Somebody says hollow fire fire. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I like that. So that's still raising the alarm. Uh -huh. Right, so Nola is saying sound the alarm, leave the building. Uh -huh. And she, mm -hmm. um, she says the emergency number is 311. Shakira Barnes Excellent. also said the emergency number is 311. It seems though everybody right. so we don't have the emergency debates. number. We don't have any debates about two. We don't have any debates about two. About the emergency number. Um, Mark, is, Mark is saying to um, alert persons. Mm -hmm. Which that is, is very critical. As yes. my girl that was saying, holler, perform. Holler, holler, yes. <laughs> um, Kirk is saying, check to see if all the staff have left the building. Okay. Um, and Miranda is saying, sound the alarm, check on all vulnerable persons and leave the building. Well, we have some impressive, we have some impressive people here. Yes. Impressive people. Lisa, right. well, Lisa uh -huh. okay. Activate the emergency plan. Very good, Lisa. Okay. That, yes. I think that contains everything, right, Mr. Mr. Edwards? <laughs> yes, uh, let's, let's right. see how good they are. Let's see, let's, let's, <laughs> let's see what we have in the following slide then. Right, okay. so we will see where we're going from here. So in the event of a fire, remember activate the alarm, you said that. Call the emergency services, you said that. Evacuate the building as quickly and calmly. And you, you see those two words, quickly and calmly. I would like to tie it up by saying efficiently. Do not use the elevator. Do not open warm or smoking doors. And how you will know if the door is warm, I want you always to feel the way you would normally feel for temperature. Always feel with the back of your palm, not with your palm of itself. That gives you a false sense of security. 
And of course, you can use the fire extinguisher if you are trained, remember that. And of course, stay low to the ground if you are in a smoke filled environment. And I do not expect for you to be in a smoke filled environment once you evacuate or follow the plan. But if you are caught in a smoke filled environment, remember to stay low, keep in contact with the wall as you go. So it is not staying low and just staying low because you are still in the environment. Stay low and keep in contact with the wall that will lead you to an exit. And once you get out, you will go immediately to the assembly point or the master point to be accounted for. And if you've done that, you would have done a wonderful job because once the fire service arrived, the first question will be, is everyone accounted for? I also want to hasten quickly to make the point that always remember your service providers. There are persons that come sometimes to fix the elevator, well, the elevator or the air condition system. Those persons may be on top of the building. It is important that there are records that those persons are on your compound and they must also follow the plan. Very important. Healthcare facilities. So this is places like the hospital and so on. Um, there's something called race. There are four essential steps to take cover. I just made mention of them quickly. Rescue anyone in immediate danger of the fire. And nurses and all that, they are already trained in this particular discipline. The alarm, pull the nearest fire alarm and call response. And call fire response. We spoke about that earlier. And of course, contain fire by closing all doors in the fire area. And once you close the door, it actually prevents the heated gases or what we call the smoke from endangering participants while you get out safely. And if you are competent in using the fire extinguisher, remember small fires, if you are competent, do it. If you're not, then leave the area and close the doors. The, ne the next science behind closing the door, you would actually prevent oxygen from getting in. That is something that supports fire or supports combustion. So you want to, wherever possible, close doors. Now, I wonder how many of you, and those of you that have children particularly, children know this one very, very well. They are taught at school. They can teach you it at home. What to do if your clothes catches a fire? And it is always stop where you are. And that's easy to say. Huh? That is easy to say. But it's not the easiest thing to do. Because once it happens, persons have the tendency to run. And if you run out into the atmosphere where there's oxygen, then you're going to make the situation worse for you. So stop where you are, drop to the ground. And the last one, roll. Roll and cover your face with your hand. In other words, you want to minimize any possible damage to your beautiful face. So that is the principle in the stop, drop, and roll if your clothing catches a fire. Now, sometimes you hear a lot about a fire warden, and you know, inside of the public service, persons are normally reluctant to take up this responsibility. But this is a question of empowerment and job enrichment. I will be quick to say to you, though, that there might not be any additional compensation for this particular role, but it is very important that. If you are going to be taking out that particular role, remember it is a voluntary function. In other words, nobody can make you do fire warden. It is something that you must have the gut for because you are expected to provide leadership in the event that there's an evacuation of the facility. Not only that, but that fire warden should also check to ensure that the fire extinguishers are always up to date. But the major functions of the fire warden, station at the designated evacuation area or point, and they will always make sure that there's orderly evacuation, usher persons to the nearest exit and direct them to the assembly point. In other words, you don't have any friends in this particular case. You are very assertive in this particular function. And you can see that look on the fire warden face, right? Clear all exits once the building has been cleared. In other words, ensure that nobody is close to the exit, that they are all in the assembly area. Some people like to go around and say, Mother Samaria Hall, I want to be all out here. I want to get close to the building. The fire warden is supposed to ensure that does not happen. 
you go to the assembly area. Guard the exit to ensure that there is not re-entry because very often, and just recently I was doing a drill at a particular institution and everybody gone to the assembly area and left the building open. And my question was, suppose somebody in the neighborhood saw them leaving and that person was entering. Can you see where that would have gone? So somebody must take responsibility. There will not be any building, but they will be in a position that they can see if anybody is approaching any of the exits that are open at that point. And once the order has been given by the emergency services, then the orderly re-entry into the building that business can restart is given by the fire warden. I remember this, that the emergency services will actually carry out that particular function and advise that it is all right to re-enter the building. Now, we have spoken a lot about some fire safety issues. I just want to encourage you here that um, there are some tips, and this list is not exhaustive. There are many, but as it relates to the workplace, I want you to remember this. Number one, remember I said that your emergency plan it is a, a document that is dynamic. It is not static. So you don't just get a plan and just put it on the shelf somewhere. It must be revisited. So upgrade that emergency plan. Carry out routine checks and carry out routine assessments and reassessments. Report any electrical hazards. We spoke about that before. Do not overload electrical circuits. Guys, if you overload electrical circuits, it means that you are going to be posing problems. Also, um, use surge protectors. We talked about that earlier when we talk about um, not using power strips. Do not use damaged electrical outlets or damaged cards. Properly store inflammable materials or flammable materials. In other words, they should be stored in a special area that they cannot pose any risk. And when the fire service come to inspect those things we are actually looking for. Keep combustibles away from electrical equipment. Electrical equipment, they're heat producers. They can also start fires. Pay attention to fire prone areas areas where you have the greatest risk, areas where you have lots of flammables and chemicals and all these things. Keep exits clear and mark emergency exits. That is why signage is important. Properly maintain and deploy fire safety equipment. And we spoke about that at length earlier. And last but by no means least, educate and train employees on the organization fire safety and evacuation procedure. Guys, I want to say that the only thing that is more expensive than training is ignorance. And you can ponder on that particular statement. So it's important to train your staff. I want to say thank you very much for listening. Um, I've come to the end of my presentation. Um, we, yes, we had some challenges. And I want to say thank you very much for attending. And of course, we will be going to our questions and answer segment. I'm going to ask my producer to handle this particular area for me. In case you have any questions, you can provide that at this point. Okay, colleagues, as Mr. Edwards um, has said, you can post your questions in the chat during our Q&A segment and I see that some persons would have already posted their questions in the chat and we will share those questions with uh, Mr. Edwards. So Mr. Edwards, our producer will show those, share those questions with you and you can respond to those questions while I go through the chat for other questions from our participants. Very good. Okay. Uh, we have a question here, uh, just trying to get it sorted. Okay. Okay. Um, if the fire alarm goes off, it's not a drill and the fire or cause of alarm was identified. Is it right for managers 
or other persons in charge to say that it is okay to re-enter. And there is I'm, no, I'm, uh -huh. right. Oh, that's where the person ended, right. Did I repeat that for you? This is from Kerry, Kerry Allen. Mm -hmm. If the fire alarm goes off, and it's not a drill, and the fire or cause of alarm was identified, is it right for managers or other persons in charge to say that it is okay to re-enter the building? Kerry, I, I, I respond to your question like this, huh? I always say to people, if you know, or if it is public knowledge, why the alarm was actuated, there is no issues as it relates to management taking that particular role. Because there's no sense in asking the fire service to respond when you know that a child or somebody carelessly actuated the alarm. Because as I said before, I want to treat every alarm as if it is real. But if we know that it is not a drill, if we don't know that it's a fire, best practice is that the fire service or the emergency services respond. And it is only the emergency services that should give the all clear to re-enter the building. But I will make that very important point. If you know, if it is known why the alarm was actuated, then that is fine for management to do. But otherwise, the emergency services should give the all clear for re-entry. Any more questions? Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Thank you, Carrie, for your question. We have Michelle. Michelle is at saying, persons have a habit of removing their vehicles when the alarm sounds. How safe is that, especially in basements and high-rise car parks? That's a very good question. That's a very, very good question. You know, I have said, before, and I will continue to say, you can get back another car. It is gonna be extremely impossible to get back that same life. And your plans reflect, reflect that once the alarm is actuated, it is important for you to make your way to the assembly area. But I know, I know perfectly well what you're talking about. And especially persons and authority they tend to think that what is happening does not appeal or apply to them. But once you are leaving, once that alarm is actuated, even if you are leaving or you are given permission to leave, notice what I said, you are supposed to be given permission. Because if you just up and leave, once the fire service arrives and we ask the question, is everybody accounted for? And we hear no, um, such a person said that I, I see somebody or I see Mr. X or Mrs. X leave her car and that cannot be verified. You know what you're actually doing? Then you are actually putting my personnel at risk, leaving or looking for a person that is not on the compound. So if you are going to be leaving for any reason once the alarm is actuated, you might be on your way out when it happens. I don't know. But best practices is that once you are an occupant in the building and the fire alarm goes, everyone, Every single person is expected to proceed to the assembly area to be accounted for by a head count. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Ms. Everts. Okay, we have another question here. Um, I think this one is Joanne. Joanne is asking, where can you get your home fire extinguishers checked? Yes, very, very good question, Joanne. And I can see that you're looking at your home and your mind's eye. That is fantastic. Um, if you have a fire extinguisher at home already, Joanne, I will say to you, it is important, just like the workplace, to have that extinguisher check at least once a year. And I, although the fire department does not bind itself to any particular institution, the three more popular ones in Barbados is safety supplies, carb supply, and regional fire security. So you can take your fire extinguisher to any of those institutions 
and they can provide that service for you. Remember though, that if it is a one-time use or a disposable fire extinguisher, um, the need to check it is not really key at that point because once you use it, there is no opportunity to do it a second time. You must replace it. But if it has not been tampered with, then it is absolutely fine, whether it's disposable or rechargeable, to take it to any of those institutions I've mentioned before, which is safety supplies, regional fire security, or care supply, and they can have that extinguisher service for you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Harris. Thank you, Joanne. And we have Mark asking, what about a situation where everybody is panicking? What do you do? What about that situation? Mark, excellent question. You know, and I always say to people that if you practice or you institute drills in your fireplace, a fire drill is a rehearsal. I say that again. A fire drill is a rehearsal for persons that are in possible danger to act in a calm and efficient manner as they evacuate the building. So the point I'm making here is that if persons get into the culture of actually practicing drills, then once it happens for real, then they will behave consistent with how persons that are evacuating should behave. But if you don't do it and people are told to evacuate, you probably got a fire, then people are going to behave in abnormal ways. And I always remember an experience with a building not too far from here where they were, we're going to be having a drill at two o'clock. And this is the problem when everybody knows that there is a drill because everybody watching the clock and watching two o'clock. Okay. And you know what happened? The alarm went off for real at 10 minutes to two and everybody stood up and freeze and said, wait, it isn't two o'clock yet. So you know what? They had delayed their mm -hmm. exit from the building. You dropped and really, truly, you are supposed to be out of the building within three minutes. That is what we are looking for, for you to be out of the building in three minutes. So I hope I answer your question, Mark. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Um, we have a few minutes left, so we're gonna address about two more questions. And the colleagues never uh, don't fare. Those questions that we have an opportunity to respond to in this forum, we will compile those questions and we will share them with Mr. Edwards and he will endeavor to respond to those questions within a week of this webinar. So you will Absolutely. still get your questions answered. So there are my next two questions. Um, we have a question earlier where a participant wanted the difference clarified between the smoke detector and the alarm. Okay. Um, just to explain that, because clearly you would have missed what I said. Now the smoke alarm. It is the independent system that you can go to any hardware store and purchase for about $20. You will normally get some two-side tape or you can utilize the screws as provided and you can have it placed on your ceiling. And I will suggest to you that the best place to put smoke alarm inside of your home is in the hallway leading to bedrooms or in the living room. Um, not necessarily kitchen unless it is recommended for kitchen areas. Now that is a smoke alarm. Once you are talking about a smoke detector, the smoke detector is the one that you will normally find in the workplace. And I said normally, mm -hmm. it is electrically operated. That once it is actuated, it sends a message to the alarm panel. And I, I think you know the alarm panel is the area where everybody focus on. Once the alarm goes where everybody go and look at the box to see where the problem is at. So it is the smoke detector that send the message to tell you where the problem is at so that you have an area or a focal point of your search once that alarm has been actuated. So I think, I hope you understand the difference between the two. One you can purchase from the hardware store and one is a significant investment. Let me put it that way.
Okay. There was another Thank question. You. This is our mm -hmm. last question before we go. And this participant uh, wants to know um, what is being done with these buildings that have one entry and one exit or blocked or locked exits? You saved the best for last. That person already saved the best for last. Um, that's a very good question. What I can say to you, and I, I know that where you are a referent to, we had an episode many years ago in our history. But what I can say to you that the buildings that are already existing, we will never be allowed to lick down and break down to build back a more modern facility unless that is the development of the country. So as it relates to the law that we talked about earlier this morning, the law now requires that where you have only one point of entry or exit, that then you should really have early warning systems installed. You should also have firefighting equipment in place. You should also have your staff trained that they can assist in the event of. Because depending on where you are, there are some business places and some workplaces that just cannot or don't have the room that they can install an alternative exit. But once you have these measures or you follow the course of the law, then it is quite easy that any person that is in danger can adequately evacuate without having themselves placed in danger. So that is the best possible way that I can answer your question, colleague. Okay, so thank you very much, Mr. Evers, for those responses. And I say thank you on behalf of the participants as well. Colleagues, we've come to the end of this presentation. Mr. Evers, do you have any um, parting words for us? Yes, indeed. Everybody, I want to say, in addition to thank you for attending, but I hope that this presentation this morning goes a long way of helping you to institute some changes where they need to be changes and to be able to make a difference. It, we are in the business of keeping people safe. And that is why I take pleasure this morning in providing this information for you. If you need additional information, feel free to contact our fire prevention unit at 535 7828 29 30 31 up to 32. Or if you need to contact me, I, my office is based at the airport and my cell number is 836 7906. Thank you and have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Evers. Colleagues, the uh, feedback form that I spoke to you earlier is now in the chat. The link to that form is now in the chat. And we encourage you to complete that form. Your information, your feedback on that form is very important to us. It helps us to improve on these um, webinars and our training products for you each time. So please fill those forms out, the information um, you know, it's a very anonymous form. So no names attached to the forms, just your information that would help us to have a better production every time. So without further ado, once again, Mr. Edwards, I wish to extend a very heartfelt and serious thank you on behalf of the Director General, Ministry of the Public Service, the Director of the Learning Development Directorate, and of course, our participants. Thank, thank you. you for taking that the time out of your busy schedule to share this valuable information with us. And we also wish to thank the Chief Fire Officer for the support of the Barbados Fire Service. And to you colleagues, thank you for joining and sharing your questions and comments and your feedback. We also want to thank you so very much for your patience, 
while we were experiencing those connectivity issues. And lastly, but never the least, many thanks as well to my producer, Mr. Sherwin Ellis, and to my support team here at the Learning and Development Directorate. Colleagues, until we meet again at our next webinar, hopefully, do have a safe and productive remainder of the day, and do have an enjoyable weekend. Goodbye. Cool. Well done, thy faithful servant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear.